All right, sounds good. Dearly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day that we can come together into fellowship and to learn about your word. Lord, I just uh, thank you for Kendall and his um, time and preparation that he's put into this to teach us about your word. And just, Lord, I pray that as we um, are here this morning, that we can open our hearts up, that we can hear what you have to say for us, and that we can learn these things, and that we can teach others. Lord, I just thank you for the ability of technology to be able to do these things, that we can uh, continue to do them no matter where we are in the world. Lord, I just thank you again for all that you do for us and provide us with. Lord, we love you always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, we are going to have a shortened class today, but uh, we're still going to uh, cover some good stuff. So let me pull up, uh, do the screen share. There we go. Okay, we are in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. And if you'll recall, uh, this chapter, we've been talking about having a superior response. So there's a lot of practical how-to stuff for the Christian life. Very typical of a Pauline letter. Deal with the theology, the philosophical level, have the uh, application, and then get down to the nitty-gritty at the end of uh, personal instruction. And so we talked about um, our families. We talked about response to others. We talked about a response to wealth. And then today, we're going to start off in verse 7 and talk about our response to leaders. So look at uh, 13.7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away with all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. So even now, at this point, early in Christianity, Gnosticism is creeping up, along with Jewish mysticism, along with the Judaizers who demand that you eat certain uh, Jewish foods and follow the Jewish dietary laws. And the author of Hebrews Paul here is basically going through and saying, don't be carried away by all kinds of teachings. Jesus is, uh, is, is the same. Um, and our hearts are strengthened by grace, not by ceremonialism, not by uh, following Lent or doing Ash Wednesday or s eating certain foods, only fish on Friday. All of that stuff is the doctrine of demons. Uh, and they're of no value to those who, who eat them and participate in them. Um, don't be carried away with strange, weird teachings. Okay. Um, our hearts are strengthened by God's grace, not by us doing some ceremonies. Um, and, and Christ is, is the same, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but here he's basically saying, look, look at your leaders and how they lived. They weren't carried away by strange teaching. Their hearts were strengthened by grace. They weren't into ceremonial foods and stuff like that. That's not how they were strengthened spiritually. It wasn't something, you know, the, the stuff that people pass off as spiritual today is just old mysticism and regurgitated paganism. We're going to go to a labyrinth and walk through this labyrinth and do a, a self-discovery of spiritualism and pray as we go through the labyrinth. What in the world? What? What? That was the kind of junk. I had people I knew who were students at Lincoln Bible College who were being taught that kind of we're going to go to a labyrinth. What? That's something spiritual. People are so, uh, you know, they want to be do something spiritual. And so, you know, they got to do some sort of, It's it doesn't work like that. That's not spiritualism. That's not uh, being spiritually minded. It's actually very fleshly. And uh, the monastic movement and not marrying or asceticism or living in a cave or not speaking for a year, all these weird things these people come up to do that supposedly have a spiritual moment. And they even pervert the biblical thing of fasting. They prevent, 
And, and if you took my Calibrate class at Summit, you know what I'm talking about, how they'll pervert biblical fasting into pagan fasting. And so I want you to think about your leaders and the people who taught you and their faith and their outcome. You know, think about the apostles. And for you individually, you guys, you know, think about my dad. Um, think about the people who influenced you in the way of the life. And think about the godly people who led you to the Lord. Think about your parents, your grandparents, if they were godly people or the influential people in your church. You know, I always tell people, you want to have good kids. You want to raise good kids. Then find the godly older couple that raised their kids to adults and they've got fine Christian adult kids and they and they raised a, a slew of good kids. Go to them and ask them how they did it and imitate them. In other words, look at what's successful, he's saying here in verse seven, and imitate that. You know, the stuff that works. You know, if you want to model a growing a church and evangelizing in a hostile in, in a hostile world that doesn't appreciate Christianity, read the book of Acts and imitate it. You don't have to go to Saddleback Church in California, or you don't have to go down to some mega church in Atlanta at North Point. You don't have to imitate, you know, it, the Bible says repent and be baptized, not repent and be Baptist. Uh, we, we, need, we need to follow the model of Acts. That's the successful model. Look to your apostolic leaders and imitate their faith. Over and over and over again, we're told to imitate, hold to the traditions of the apostles, to follow the example of the apostles as they followed the example of Christ. If you want a model of Christian life, look to the scriptures, look to the book of Acts. It's not just descriptive, it's prescriptive. So remember your leaders. Remember who taught you. Remember the, the, the apostles who gave you the scriptures. Rem look at their life and imitate their faith. Learn from them. Consider their outcome. And that's not only a positive thing, a negative thing. Maybe there, maybe you had a parent and they had this one particular flaw. And you're like, man, I love dad, but he did do this one thing and he should have then learn from that and grow from it. Consider outcome and imitate where they had faith, where they didn't, don't imitate, where they did, imitate. And Jesus is unchanging in character, not his actions. So Jesus is unchanging, okay? He's not going to flip the script and all of a sudden it's a totally different gospel. Um, but he's unchanged. But people use that to say, well, they spoke in tongues back then in the first century and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we got to speak in tongues today. That verse has nothing to do. There's all kinds of miracles in the Bible that were singular. Is God going to be born of a woman again? Is there going to be another worldwide flood? Should I expect to be swallowed by a giant fish and regurgitated? Uh, there's all kinds of miracles God did that were one-offs, okay? Or that were for a limited time. So, to apply this verse about the character of Jesus and the doctrine of Jesus and try to apply that to his miracles or the use of miracles in the first century by the apostles, it's not logical. So remember, Jesus is unchanging in his character, not his actions. He does singular things sometimes. And he does one thing at one time and another thing at another time. So uh, he it's his character that doesn't change because he is i am he is unchanging he just is um and then be strengthened by relationships of faith and character not ceremonial food or rituals okay we are strengthened by our relationships by the grace of god by the character of our leaders it's remembering our leaders and imitating their faith that makes us spiritual not well i you know ate this ceremonial food, or I went, I kept the Sabbath, uh, or I uh, kept the dietary laws, no bacon for me, or whatever. It's not about ceremonial food, or rituals, or, uh, you know, doing, oh, I went and did something spiritual, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about um, imitating the doctrine and the faith, having a relationship with Christ, having character. Those are the things we should look to. 
be led by godly leaders, not by the latest, greatest, fad, spiritual thing, you know, that, that everybody's into, you know, let's pray the prayer of Jabez, you know, whatever weird, uh, new, um, you know, Christian fashion uh, comes along or some pagan practice that they're trying to reincorporate into our worship of God. Don't fall for that kind of stuff. So our response to our leaders and, and our lives and what we do to grow in our relationship with God, it needs to be a response to this superior covenant. In an old inferior covenant, there was all kinds of ritual. And in the new covenant, not so much. Um, and then our response to suffering, uh, verse 10 through 14. We have an altar, which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Now, did we have the right to eat from the food at the tabernacle? No. Why? Because we are not descendants of Levi. Okay. So he's flipping the script here. And he says, we have an altar, which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we're looking for a city that is to come. What's he saying in there in that passage? Um, we need to join Christ in his sufferings. And, and that is a rejection of this world. Okay, so he's making this comparison. Um, we're, we got a high priest that doesn't take animal blood. We got a superior We've got a superior sacrifice and a superior holy place. And our holy place isn't here on earth. Our holy place is in heaven. And now the body, the blood was offered there, but the, the body was taken outside the camp. And Jesus suffered outside the city gate. He suffered outside of Jerusalem to make the people holy through his blood. Let us then go with him outside of the camp. What What's the camp he's talking about there? Judaism. The physical Jerusalem, the Old Testament law, human systems, uh, human ritualism, ceremonial things, and bear the disgrace. Let's suffer for the cause of Christ. We're going to be rejected. We're going to be attacked. See, if, if you don't live according to the world's pattern, the world will hate you, and the world will make you suffer. And because why? Because here we don't have an enduring city. Is Jerusalem... Physical Jerusalem, an enduring city. No. Will it eventually pass away? Yes. We won't get what we've been promised here. But we're looking for the city that is to come. We're not living for the here and now. So what should our response to suffering be? Live for heaven. You're going to suffer. Your spouse isn't going to be perfect. Your kids aren't going to be perfect. Your parents aren't going to be perfect. Your elders aren't going to be perfect. Your deacons aren't going to be perfect. Your church isn't going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. Nothing here is going to be perfect. It will be a, a, a cascading succession of sufferings that at times get worse and intense to the point you don't think you can handle it. And physically, your physical health will get worse and worse as you grow older. And you're going to go through all kinds of ups and downs but we don't have an enduring city here. We're not gaining our inheritance here. And here we're going outside. We're walking out of this city. You know, pack your bags for heaven and live like you're walking there. And as you go on the Via Della Rosa, right? Bear the disgrace. Like part of his punishment for our sins was the beating he took and then the walk of shame carrying the cross. And we're told to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And that's what he's saying here. He he had to go outside the city. Bearing disgrace he bore. You do that. Um, 
the ram of Passover. They would put the sins of the on the ram and then take the ram out city and let it go. And that's us. We have to be cast out of this world and be willing to suffer in this world because we're not looking for an earthly city. We're looking for a heavenly city, a heavenly city that is to come. We're living for heaven. So what should your response to suffering be? Well, Jesus is our sacrifice. They can't partake of. So we partake of this sacrifice knowing the benefit that's going to come from it. We're made holy by his blood. So in the face of suffering, we can say, I'm forgiven. I'm transformed. I'm changed. I'm going to be healed. It's all going to work out. The blood of Jesus has paid the way. I'm not good enough, but Jesus paid my way. And we choose suffering and disgrace outside the city now so that we can be in the heavenly city later. If you choose to live in the city now and avoid disgrace now, you'll never make it to the heavenly city then. You'll suffer then and be cast out then. So either you have to carry your cross out of the city and suffer now so you can go to heaven, or you can enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin now and be cast out then and miss the heavenly city. You're choosing which city. And so our response to suffering should be, bring it on. Let's do this. Give me my cross, I'm going to carry it. And for the sake of the lost, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of Christ, you're going to suffer. There's going to be difficult meetings. There's going to be difficult Christians. There's going to be difficult uh, difficulties in your marriage. Satan is going to attack you. He's going to attack your children. He's going to try to divide you from your spouse. He's going to try to divide you from your elders. He's going to try to divide you from your friends. He's going to try to break you down, tempt you, destroy you. He's going to try to get you distracted with money and with greed and with possessions and with pride and with doing things for yourself instead of really for the Lord. There's all kinds of the suffering there you're going to face. Pick it up, carry it, knowing that the blood of Jesus forgives your, your faults are going to be paid for. Yes, you're going to make mistakes along the way, but he's going to atone for it. And you're headed to a heavenly city. Set your eyes and your heart and your mind on Jesus, who is in the right hand of God, and you are headed there. That's where you're walking. The response to suffering has to be a resolute, I'm going to serve God no matter what, come hell or high water. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my God can save me, but even if he doesn't, I'm not bowing down to your stupid idol. You have to have that resolve. You know, I saw a quote from Elon Musk, and people were asking him, how do you stay positive when so many things are negative, when negative things happen? He said, he's like, I don't think that way. I don't think of, is this positive or negative? I think I've got a goal and it's got to get done and I'm going to keep going until it's done. And, you know, don't think about, well, how do I stay positive in the ministry? That's going to be impossible. How do I, you know, how do I keep a good, no, no. Fix your eyes on Jesus on the goal and just go. And that's what's going to help your attitude more than anything. The way you're going to stay positive is you stay focused. Set your mind, set your heart. And it means I'm going to cover your cross. And I'm going to, even when I'm suffering, I'm going to rejoice. And even though he slay me, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to trust him. He knows and he's doing good and he's going to bring good out of any bad. And I'm just going to go through whatever. And you just have to have faith. He answers prayers and moves forward. And that's why our response needs to be praise. Look at verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So what should our response be to the fact that Jesus is leading us to a heavenly city and Jesus's blood pays for it. And we partake of the communion. We partake of a, of, a, of a sacrifice they're not allowed to, both physically when we take communion and spiritually in what communion represents. We are partakers of the one loaf, the body of Christ, and that they have no right to eat. Since we have all those blessings and the promise of salvation in heaven, even if we have to go through suffering, 
the promise of resurrection, then we should be praising him. So through Jesus, let us how often? Continually offer to God a sacrifice of what? Praise. And so um, praise is not all that worship is. Sometimes we act like praise and worship are synonyms, and they're not. Many things can be worship. Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to God is worship. Uh, serving the homeless is worship. Keeping a tight rein on our tongue is is worship. Um, you know, all kinds of everything we do should be worship. But this is talking about the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of your lips to confess his name. We should be continually praising God and confessing the name of Jesus. It should be continual. If somebody knows you and spends time with you, works with you or whatever, and they don't know you're a Christian, if you get a family member that doesn't know what you believe, you get a friend that doesn't know what you believe, you get a coworker, you got a neighbor that doesn't know what you believe, shame on you. We should be continually offering to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And not only should we be saying about God, talking about God, we should be doing good and sharing with others for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Another way that we sacrifice to worship God is we share with others. We're benevolence. So you're offering. Um, Corinthians taught us that on the first day of the week, we're to bring in uh, a portion, a uh, percentage of what we made that week and give it to the Lord. And we should do that with a grateful heart. And we should share with others benevolence, helping someone, giving someone, meeting the need of someone, giving an offering to someone who's in need and helping him pay for a bill or supporting a ministry or sending a missionary to Africa or whatever. All of that, that plea with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It would be wrong, terrible, in fact, for us to receive such a wonderful covenant and not even give a tenth that they gave in the old covenant. If Abraham and Isaac tithed, if Moses and the people of Israel tithed, how much more should we under a new and better covenant do more and go above and beyond? So let's offer our verbal praise and our actions. Through Jesus, we continually offer a sacrifice of praise from our lips and to do good to others and such sacrifices please God. God is pleased when we tell others about him, when we praise him, when we confess his name, when we sing. Uh, God, When he is praised and when others are helped, that pleases God. You want to put a smile on your heavenly father's face. You're thankful because he died for you. And you want to show him thanks? Don't resist certain foods and have ceremonial foods or not eat anything but fish on Friday or put ash on your forehead. Go out and help an orphan, help a widow. Mow the yard of an older person that can't mow the yard. Help somebody out that needs help. Go do something good. Visit a nursing home. Visit a jail. Work with Tear Down the Walls Ministry and the homeless, you know, or whatever. Help do something with eyes, you know. Help a tornado disaster victim. Whatever. Those kind of things, those kind of sacrifices, God is pleased. I heard someone say once, and I don't agree with this statement, but I understand partly why they said it. They said, um, we should preach Jesus every day and when necessary, use words. Well, according to this, words are always necessary. When when should we be using words from our lips to praise God? How often? Continually. So I don't agree with that person's statement. But what I do agree with is that our words should be matched by our what? Actions. If we're sitting there, oh, yes, Jesus is such a giver and a provider, Um oh, I'm sorry that you have no food to eat. I've got extra, but I'm not going to share it. Have a nice day. God loves you, and I do too. Whatever. You know, if you see a brother or sister in need and you don't meet their needs, what good is it? Paul asks in James too. You know, what good is it? If you, if you keep warm and well-fed, 
How can they? You got God, you were God's person to help them and you didn't. So our response to God should be from our lips and with our giving. Um, now that does not atone for sin. In the Old Testament, there was different kinds of sins. There were sin offerings that was a blood sacrifice that atoned for sins. There's other offerings that were like you gave a tithe, you give a grain offering or a wine offering, and those were called what? Fellowship offerings. Those are, I'm thankful for what you've done for me, God, and I'm just showing my appreciation. And that's the kind of offerings and sacrifices these are. I don't help the homeless because I think it's going to atone for my sin. I help the homeless because Jesus atoned for my sin. I don't go visit the widow in the nursing home because I think it's going to um, save me from my sins. I go and visit her because Jesus saved me from my sins and I want to share his love with others. And with such sacrifices, it's, I'm pleasing him. So when we offer a sacrifice of praise or when we offer a sacrifice of good works towards those in need, that pleases God. Doesn't atone for sin. Our sins are already atoned for by the blood of Jesus. We already discussed that. It's a response to the superior covenant and it's one of praise. And we should have a response of gratitude and thanksgiving that manifests itself in us continuously singing his praises talking about his salvation to others, and doing nice things for people. It doesn't do any good for you to go to work and talk about how much you love Jesus and how good Jesus is, is if you're a jerk and you're selfish, you're greedy, and you're eating your co-worker's lunch out of their uh, office fridge without telling them, and you're not sharing, and you're rude, and you're whatever, you know, if your life does not match your words, then that sacrifice is ugly. We offer these sacrifices um, to show the love of God that he has given us. Um, again, we're going to go back to leaders. Um, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so their work will be a joy, not a burden for you. That would be no advantage to you. If you think rebelling against the elders, deacons, preacher in your church is going to in any way be an advantage to you, you are incorrect. Obey your leaders. Submit to their authority. Now, sometimes people in church abuse their authority. They, they exercise authority they don't have. They lord it over the flock. And that needs addressed. And that needs pointed out. And there are sometimes where leaders are so abusive, you can't follow their leadership and you need to leave and go to another church. I understand the exceptions to the rule. Just like you're to submit to your parents, but if the parents beating the tar out of you every night or sexually molesting you, it's not your obligation to stay there and get beat to death or raped. So they have given up their parental right. And if people abuse their leadership to the point of absolute abuse. Yeah, it's not wrong to go to another church or to not, and if, if the church leaders are telling you, you can't take communion on Sunday, well then no, you're not gonna listen to them because God tells you to take communion. So obviously there's exceptions to this, but if they aren't doing anything undoctrinal or wrong, obey them, submit to their authority. Um, they keep watch over you as men who must give an account. So, by the way, FYI, before you go into leadership, understand that you're going to have to give an account someday. The elders might not know what you're doing in your office all week because they're not there. They're off at their jobs or their homes. And no one may know what you're doing with your time with your office if you're lazing around or doing something sinful instead of doing God's work. But God knows. And you got to give an account. People might not notice if you don't call on people or if you don't minister to people or you don't address sin in people's lives or you don't encourage, some people might not notice, but God notices. And if you don't address the man who's having an affair on his wife, if you don't address the woman who's got an addiction problem, if you don't address the sins in people's lives, you're going to have to give an account to God on their behalf. If you don't get up and preach against sin, if you don't 
deal with the doctrinal issues in the church, you're going to have to give an account. So these guys are concerned about your soul. They're concerned about your life. And they've got to keep watch over you. And they've got to answer to God for how they responded. So obey them so that their work will be a joy. Make, encourage your preacher, encourage your elders, encourage your deacons. Get involved. Be helpful. Be positive. Be submissive. Uh, don't be a negative, nanny, naysaying, uncooperative, complaining, griping church member. God, Moses had those kind of followers and God dealt with them most severely. Don't be like Moses's followers. Be like Joshua's followers. Don't be like Moses's followers. Be like Joshua's followers. So that their work is a joy. So that they, oh man, I'm going to go today and go calling with this brother. He's such a joy to be with. He's such a, a blessing. You know, what if, oh, right. I, what if a, what if an elder's like, all oh, right, I get to go have an awesome, fun meeting with a preacher. Yay. Woohoo. Make it a joy for them. Don't make it hard by being a stubborn, rebellious person. And the, you know what the ironic thing is? If you will be obey and submissive and you make their work a joy, you'll actually have influence with them. And if they're doing something wrong or something they could do better, you'll actually gain their ear by living like this. Remember Hebrews 13, 17. Remember 1 Corinthians 10's warning. Do not be a complaining, griping, unsubmissive, self-righteous, know-it-all follower. Obey and submit to authority. There are some people who have positions of authority, and we need to recognize those positions of authority. Now, if they abuse them, that's on them, and God will deal with them. But we need to recognize authority and submit to it. Um, overseers must give an account, especially if you're an elder. You're going to have to you're going to have to give an account for every member of the flock. Don't make leaders work a burden; make their load easier. And they will bless you, be blessed, and you will be blessed as well. So we need to have a different response to our leaders. We need to have a different response to God. Hebrews 13, 18. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. So whoever the author was, was kept from them. What was keeping them? What was how did they need to be restored? It's almost like I don't know, they were in prison or something. Pray that I may be restored to you soon. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So notice uh, he's calling for, for prayer, little prayer request section here. Um, our response to God because of this covenant, because now we can approach the throne of grace with confidence, then we should be praying. We should be approaching the throne. Our response to God should be prayer and a lot of it. And often, um, for those of you who heard my Calibrate class, one of the things I said about prayer that is so important is, you know, you guys pray at dinner maybe with your family. Or maybe you pray at the beginning of a class. Or maybe you pray on your Wednesday night with your prayer group. Or maybe you pray during a church service. Or maybe you pray with a sick person. All of those are prayers with others. And there's nothing wrong with praying with others. But here, here's the problem. If most of your prayer life is with others and not private, something's very, very wrong. The majority of your prayer 
the majority of your time in prayer should be alone. And if the only times you're praying is when you're with others, uh, that says something about your, your relationship with God, that it's only when others are around. Your prayer life needs to be, it doesn't have to be long and flowery or, you know, the more you do it, the longer it'll get and the more natural it'll be. But it needs to be real and often throughout the day. And we need to be praying for others, not just ourselves. You're like, well, how do you pray for an hour? I mean, uh, what do you say for an hour? Uh, well, if you only pray for yourself and go through your Santa wish list and treat, treat Jesus like Santa in the in the heavens, you know, I want a new toy bike and I want my, I want this and I would give me that and give me this and give me that. If that's how you're treating prayer, okay, yeah, I can see how in about five minutes you'll be done. But when you start praying for others, when you make a list, um, when you go over this, this prayer list and you've got all these people who you pray for every day that you mention to God every day, you're praying for others, not just yourself. Then it gets longer. Unless you're totally antisocial, hateful, and have no friends or family. Uh, and if that's the case, spend some time praying for me. Um, put me on your list. Um, actually, I would appreciate it if you all prayed for me. Um, I really, really need it. Uh, Satan is loves to destroy anything we try to build. And... Uh, I'm trying to build some things right now. So um, be praying for me. Um, and desire to live honorably in every way. Um, have a big conscience. I mean, one of the responses to God um, for him dying for us and, 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 you know, should be, right, that we want to please him and live honorably in every way, you know? When it comes to the movies you watch, do you want to live honorably in every way? When it comes to music you listen to, when it comes to how you spend your time, when it comes to how you treat sinners, when it comes to your money and your finances, when it comes to how you treat your wife or your children, when it comes to how you treat people in the church, how you treat people who offer you nothing, how you treat the mentally handicapped, how you treat the sick and the elderly and the nursing home, is it honorable? Are you honorable, upright? Are you in every way trying to be a man of God, to live honorably and upright? That should be a natural response to Jesus forgave me of my sins. Jesus cleansed me. Jesus died for me. There should be an immediate attitude of wanting to live honorably in every way. And pray to be equipped with everything good for doing his will, that he may work in us what is pleasing to him. Okay? So we might not have what we need to be what God wants us to be. We need to be praying for those things. We need to be praying for others, praying that we can live honorably, praying that we can be equipped with every good thing for doing his will. So, you know, make a list of things you need to do his will. And, and I'm not just talking a wish list of, well, Lord, I'd like a new laptop to serve him and maybe a new a Ferrari to go calling in and maybe, you know, not that kind of thing. I'm talking about, you know, God, give me the emotional intelligence to understand people's real thoughts. Help me to read people's mannerisms and learn to read eye contact and body movement and posture that's speaking just as much as the words help me to read people and understand where they are help me to have a a comprehension of other people's point of view that's so much different than my own who think differently than me who have different personalities and and different characteristics and different ways of processing information and viewpoint help me to understand it lord give me the the scriptures lead, lead me to the right lesson the right book the right teacher the right ministry the right you know, relationships, uh, give me the friends I need or the people or the co-workers, you know, raise up workers in the church to come alongside me to, to run these programs or, you know, whatever it is that you need, be praying for those things. And that list should be extensive and long. I talk about adding to your prayer life. 
you can do it right there. Making a laundry list, you know, what do you need? Uh, God, I need some friends to support me at this church. God, I need some finances. God, we need some youth leaders. God, we need, you know, whatever it is you need. Pray and ask for God to give you what you need. And pray for God's glory forever and ever. Um, we need to be seeking, praying for, and, and longing for, and working towards the glory of God. I mean, after all he's done for us, I mean, this superior covenant, superior revelation, superior uh, sacrifice, a superior altar, a superior high priest, um, a superior tabernacle, a superior table of showbread, a superior lampstand, a superior altar of incense, uh, no wall of separation, no curtain, no, and a superior Ark of the Covenant, a superior, the very presence of God to be enthroned with him in heavenly places now, spiritually. The blessings we have and, and the promises he makes for our future of eternal life in, a, in, in heaven with no sickness, sorrow, death, sadness, temptation, no evil thing. I mean, our response should be overwhelmingly to glorify God, whether that's coming out in the sacrifice of praise or in acts of kindness to the needy, or whether it's coming out in just a desire to glorify God and that leads us to God in prayer. Prayer is this evidence that you believe it. And uh, like I said in my Calibrate class, there's nothing much, there's no no better barometer of a person's spiritual life than their prayer life. And then he says in verse 22, as he's closing out, brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. Now, what does bear mean? People today read the Second Amendment and they don't understand it. What does bear mean? Someone holler it out. What does it mean to bear with? It literally means to carry. I urge you to carry with my word of exhortation. Carry it. Bear with it. Put up with it. Endure it. Carry it, you know. I've written you only a short letter. I want you to know about our brother Timothy has been released. Right there, it gives you another clue. This is Paul. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those in Italy send their greetings. Where was Paul? Italy. Grace be with you all. Do you carry the word with you? Do you bear it? Do you accept it? All right, I take this on. I carry this word, you know? I accept it. Paul gave a word of exhortation here, a word of encouragement, and, and a call to live a godly life. Will you carry this with you? Um, next week, I'm, I'm going to try to get some material for you to go a little deeper about chapter 11, if we can. But I want you guys to carry this concept with you. To take this word of exhortation and have a response. Is there anything in this class that convicted you? Is there anything in this class that corrected you? Is there anything in this class that educated you? Is there anything in this class that gave you information that'll be helpful to other people? Whether it's the deity of Jesus or the superiorness of the cross or why the old covenant is done away with or the concept of, uh, you know, typology, or whether it's 
the concept and definition of faith, or whether it's the instructions in chapter 12 on suffering and discipline. You know, maybe it's some of this practical stuff in chapter 13. Are you, are you going to carry it with you? One of the most horrible things is to hear and go, wow, that's really good. That's good thought. That's true. That's right. And then not live it. Not carry it. Not to put up with it. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to put up with your word of exhortation. I want to urge your response to the word of God would be to receive it with gladness like the people in Berea. And search it diligently, daily, to see if it's true. And to come to your own reasoned uh, faith. All right? So um, let's go ahead uh, now, and we're going to take a 10-minute break. We're going to have a, a shorter class today, but um, I'm going to come back here in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to slip off here, and then we'll be back in 10. Welcome back. I want to go and read with you again from chapter 11. And I want to look at verse uh, 32. Something I've been meaning to add to the Hebrews notes and I haven't. So 1132. What more shall I say? I did not have time to tell about Gideon. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Um, he didn't have time, but uh, we just finished with chapter 13. So we do. <laughs> uh, we do have time, so I'm going to talk about him. Uh, he is listing people who by faith did something. Now, I want you to notice, um, was Noah's faith, he mentions Noah, was Noah perfect? in his faith or did he maybe get a little sloshed at one point was abraham perfect did he ever lie did he ever leave the promised land and go to egypt when he wasn't supposed to did he ever bring lot along when he wasn't supposed to uh did he sleep with hagar when he was supposed to wait for sarah you see what i'm saying abraham wasn't perfect he's listing all these people that, about their faith and what they did by faith but every one of them has faults uh isaac played parents J jacob was a liar and a deceiver uh you know moses killed a man um each one of the rahab was a prostitute these people have faults and they actually struggled in their faith but the new testament talks about them like they're faultless i had something pointed out to me once and i want you to think about it these great people of faith. The Old Testament plainly tells us their faults in 3D full color, you know, right? High resolution. <laughs> we see the faults of the people of faith from the past. But the New Testament doesn't mention them. The New Testament calls things that were not as though they were. Abraham's a great man of faith. Uh, you know, and then you look at the list of people here. Gideon, I'm supposed to have Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel as my uh, evidence of guys who had strong faith. Let me let me show you what I mean, okay? So I'm going to stop screen sharing that, and let's look at um, uh, another screen share. Well, if I can. No, no, no. I did not close them. I did not. Okay, good, good, good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, let's, um thought I accidentally clicked off the thing I wanted to use. <laughs> okay, let's look, uh, let's look at Gideon, since he's the first one mentioned here, okay? Um, and can you all see that? It's, all, it's up. Um, so I put from coward to conquer. Why? Well, the judges, you know, if you've studied Judges before, it's the story of this cycle of again and again, the 
The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them the hands of Midianites, okay? So these are like descendants of Esau that live in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it was the same thing. Israel falls away from God. God sends a pagan nation to punish them. God's people repent and pray. God raises up a judge and delivers them. They're good for a while, and then they fall away from God. And, you know, it's this cycle over and over and over again that we see in history. Um, I heard a sci-fi writer once, in one of his books, he wrote, um, the uh, hard times make for strong men. Strong men make for good times. Good times make for weak men, and weak men make for hard times. Uh, there seems to be this cycle where uh, they fall away from God, and God raises up some good guys, you know, when they repent and pray, and this good guy delivers them, and they're good for a while. When the good times come, when the good times come, then it makes soft men who fall away. And so there's that cycle, whether it's something a sci-fi writer is noticing in the history of humanity, or whether it's the book of Judges chronicling the way the cycle of history goes. Well, this is one of those times when in Midian. So the Midianites are coming. They're raping, pillaging, killing. They're, they were like grasshoppers. They came in, they would steal the crops, steal their food, steal their horses, steal their women. You know, uh, um, it's just, uh, you know, hide your children, hide your wife. They're stealing everything up in here kind of thing. So uh, that was what was going on. So he was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So wine press is a sunken hole down in the ground. He had wheat and he was threshing it. Well, that's impossible. See, to thresh, you take a fork and you throw the grain up in the air and the shaft comes loose from the grain, the grain that makes the bread and the light of the air blows the light shaft away and the heavy grain falls down in front of you. And you keep doing it till all the shaft is off the grain and the grain is shaftless and it's ready to grind and turn into bread. Well, you can't do that in a wine press. There's no wind. There's no breeze in a wine. I mean, this is a pointless venture. He's so scared and such a coward. He's threshing wine. And the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior what mighty warrior more like mighty scaredy cat wimp hiding in a hole trying to thresh grain with no breeze he's not even particularly bright uh how can i save israel my clan's the weakest in manasseh and i'm the least in my family so he has an inferiority complex as well on top of his wimpiness he's scared to death the lord said i am with you and we'll strike down all the midianites together what does God tell him he's going to do through him? Kill the Midianites. Does he believe him? Uh, no. So we got to take baby steps here. Look how patient God is. The Lord God told, tear down the father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So, okay, here's a baby step. Try this little job. Instead of taking out the Midianites, let's just get rid of the pagan idol in your town. That you're, you know, uh, it's your father's altar, you know. <laughs> But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Once again, his wimpitude is on full display. Mighty warrior? Hardly. And then he says, uh, they say to the townspeople, say, bring out your son. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar, cut it down, the Asherah pole. And uh, his dad's like, look, if Baal's so strong, let Baal judge him. So they started calling Gideon Drubable. May God judge him. So I guess he got a cool nickname. Uh, so then God tells him, no, now you got to go kill the Midianites. Okay, you got that altar taken care of. Good job. You survived that. Now let, let's go take care of the Midianites. Um, and then he's like, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you promised, look, uh, um, I'll place this wool of fleece on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on, on only the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I'll know that you will save Israel from my hands. And it happened. He still didn't believe. Gideon rose up the next day and squeezed the fleece and wrung and dew his bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, uh, don't be angry with me, but let me make just one more request. Allow one more test for the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry on the ground and cover the dew. That night God did so, and only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. Oh, he still doesn't want to do it. Look, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that needs a sign. When God came to him, with an angel in the wine press, he said, 
I'm going to be with him and help you kill the Midianites. But he wouldn't believe it. And he's looking, and even still afterwards, it's not until he goes down and hears the Midianites quaking in their boots and their tents later on when he, got to, when he has his 300 soldiers that he finally goes, okay. See, he was looking for a sign. And that was right. You, some people say, oh, the faith of Gideon that he put out the fleece. No, that was a lack of faith. When you have to put out a fleece, you know, God, it wasn't like God didn't tell him. He wasn't sitting there going, you know, the Midianites are bad and maybe I should fight him. I wonder if God wants me to. That's different. If you think maybe I should go do this ministry over here, but I'm not sure. Mm, I don't know. That's when you might put out a fleece and it's an act of faith. But when God already came to you and said, you get an army together and go fight the Midianites, there's no question anymore. And so it's not an act of great faith. It's actually an act of disbelief. Okay? And then uh, look what happens. Uh, chapter 7. In order that Israel might not boast against me, her own strength has saved her. Announced to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So God's like, no wimps, please. Uh, anybody that's a scaredy cat can go home. And the majority of them do. But there were still too many men. Take them down to the water and I'll sift them for you there. And with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So God breaks it down to 300 people. You know, sometimes we want God to do it our way and we want God to deliver our way when really his grace is sufficient and his strength is made perfect in weakness. Why won't God fix this thing or give you this thing to do what you need to do. You're like, God, I need this to do this. Help me. And he doesn't give you this because he wants you to do that amazing thing without this so that he's glorified. Sometimes God doesn't give you as much as you think you need because he wants to show he can do it from your position of weakness so that he gets the glory and you don't become proud. His strength is perfected in weakness. That's why I can be a minister, even though I'm weak. Because his strength is perfected in people like me and you. So the 300 innumerable host go and attack the Midianites, you know, and he's like, watch me, follow my lead. And they blew the trumpet, smashed the jars and threw them down. And of course, the Midianites freaked out and cry and run out and they, they started killing each other with their own swords. They In the darkness and the confusion and their own stupidity, they just kill anyone that comes at them. And so uh, we have to follow Christ's lead, throw down the jar, hold up our torches, light it, you know, this little light of mine, <laughs> I'm going to let it shine, right? And blow our trumpets and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the enemies will attack each other. Our enemies will be no more. So with that story, so he just references it like Gideon, right? But he's referencing these people who, like us, struggled at times with belief. Um, that's a point from Hebrews 11. I don't think that I fully made, probably because I was so dead tired that day. But I want you guys to understand, he's not listing people in Hebrews 11 who are these superhuman, perfect people. He was listing very broken, very uh, flawed, um, growing, evolving faith people just like you and me who are in this process. You know, it took Abraham 25 years to get, or well, more than 25 years, to get to where he trusted God enough that he would offer Isaac. It took years. And he couldn't get Gideon to just go fight right off. He was too scared. It, he had a natural inclination towards fear. He had to baby step him into it. And then he had to not give him the proper resources to do it, just to show him that God was with him. And it, his battle plan was this weird, crazy plan that didn't even involve them properly attacking. 
how did he go from I'm scared to tear down my dad's altar to Baal in the daytime to I got 300 guys and I'm going to go fight an innumerable Midianite host in a valley at night with 300 guys. So they go from really faithless, struggling with doubt. You know, he's like, he, he says to God, and hey God, where was all the stuff you did before? Now you've forgotten us. I mean, have you ever felt like Gideon? I'm the weakest from the weakest clan, from a weak family. I'm the weakest person in my family. And who am I to be a mighty warrior? Who am I to go? Well, in God, in our weakness, God's strength is perfected. And that's like a whole theme that I see in Hebrews 11 in the people that um, he chooses to to hold up to to put in front of him. Okay, let's let's do another one while while we're on this idea. Okay. So the book of Judges, we have this pattern, right? Falls away from God, sends pagan nation to punish. God's people repent and pray. God raises up a judge. Well, it happens again. Step one, after Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So Ehud did, they had fallen away. Ehud brought them back. For a generation, they were good. The Ehud generation was good. Then Ehud dies, and once again, the Israelites go back to evil. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, commander of, the, of his army, was a guy named Sisera. So God hands him over, some Canaanites, because he had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord. This time it took them 20 years before they repented and said, oh, okay, okay, God help us. So Jabin and his commander Sisera, came against Israel. Now, chapter 4, uh, verse 4 and 5 of Judges. Deborah was a prophetess, a wife of Labadoth, the leading Israel, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their dispute settled. So she was like Judge Judy, okay? I want you to picture that kind of personality, all right? She's this Judge Judy lady, okay? Female judge. Uh, that was kind of unheard of for their day. She was an exception, not the rule. But so she was leading um, by judging disputes between people because she she was educated and knew the law. And that was an amazing thing in her day. And so she sent for Barack, not Obama, but the Bible one. And some people call him Barak. I think I might like that pronunciation better, but I don't think it's accurate. I think it's Barack. Uh, son of Adonai uh, from Kadesh and Naphtali and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and the lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his troops to the Kadesh, excuse me, Kishon river and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I'll go with you. But because of the way you're going about this, the honor will not be yours. The Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. This dude was so chicken lily livered that he had to take this woman along. Now, it wasn't that he thought that Deborah was a great fighter. And we have no evidence or reason to believe that she fought in the battle. Why did he want her to come? Because he wasn't sure whether or not she was telling him the truth. And if she wouldn't come with him, then she didn't believe that he was going to win. But if she, a woman, would go to the battle 
knowing that if they lost, she would be raped, abused, and murdered as this prophetess who commanded for this battle to happen. He knew she would be dead and tortured. And if she was willing to go, then she really believed God was going to give the victory. And so his lack of faith is why he, instead of just trusting the word of the Lord, he's got to bring her along. And because of that, uh, she doesn't get, or he doesn't get the glory. God chose a man to lead. And the man wouldn't. The man refused to lead as God directed. So God gave the honor and the glory of victory to a woman. Now, did it go to Deborah? No. He gave it to another woman. God gave the victory to Barak, but not the glory. Barak's advanced and routed Sisera and all his chariots and his army by the sword. And Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. So Barak won the battle. He, he went into battle. He fought. He had the faith to go. He didn't chicken out. But he didn't get the glory of killing Sisera. He didn't get that honor. He fled on foot and he got to the tent of this lady named Jael. And she, her husband, had been friends with the Canaanites and with the king and with Sisera. And so he thought she was friendly. So he's like, this is this guy that lives here in this tent. He is friendly with us. He'll help me. So he goes there. Well, the guy's not there, but his wife's there. And she is not friendly with him. She is loyal to Israel, not him. But she pretends like she's on his side. Come, my Lord, come in. Don't be afraid. She opened a skin of milk and gave him milk and covered him. Oh, man, when you're tired, you've been fighting all day, killing Israelites, and you just lost a battle. You've had a long, hard day. Ah, uh, it's not Miller time. No, it's warm milk time. Get some warm milk in your belly. Crawl under the covers get some sleep and some rest. And so she gives him a warm, oh, that's, and that did she, you know, flip some NyQuil in there, you know, knock him out, <laughs> some Benadryl, I don't know. She gives him the warm milk, he falls asleep. And he says, if someone comes by to ask if anyone's here, say no. He's like, oh yeah, I'll send them along the way, don't worry. I'll tell them they can't come in the tent because, you know, whatever. And so, but then while he's sleeping, uh, well, Jael, Herbert's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep and exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I'll show you the man you're looking for. So he went in the tent, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. Now, this woman knew how to get her point across, right? Uh, um... <laughs> his uh his faith in her went to his head so there are two women that saved saved israel on that guy day god subdued jamin the canaanite king before the israelites and the hand of israel grew stronger and stronger against jamin the canaanite until finally they destroyed him by saving israel they allowed the messiah to come the messiah who saves us we owe a debt of gratitude to these two women and the thousands of others whom god had used to save his people God uses those that others wouldn't. Um, in James 3, it says, take ships as an example. Although they're large, they're driven by strong winds. They're steered by a very small rudder in the pilot where the pilot wants to go. And big doors swing on small hinges. Massive aircraft are guided by small flaps. The history of nations has been guided by important women. Many unseen heroes lurk in the shadows of great heroes whom they have propped up. The widow's might was the greatest gift. Um, so the point is, God used these two women and Barak. But Barak is the one who gets mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 11 for his faith. No mention of he was a coward and he had to have Deborah come along and he didn't get the glory. No, in the New Testament, because now Jesus died for his sins and God forgets our sins and his sins are as far as the east is from the west and they're buried in the depths of the sea. The New Testament has no memory about Barak's lack of faith, or Gideon's lack of faith, or David's lack of faith, or these other people's lack of faith that we see in the scriptures. It's just not there. And uh, so I would, uh, um, 
I would encourage you that when you struggle with your faith, don't think that disqualifies you. When you go, man, oh, I know God wants me to do this, but I'm scared. Will he bless me? Do I have enough faith? Yeah. You at least got Brock level. You at least got some Gideon level faith. And let him baby step you. Let him, let him lead you and guide you. And if you throw out the fleece, well, that's not ideal. It'd be a greater faith if you didn't. But hey, do what you got to do to build your faith. God was patient with him and he'll be patient with you. But don't think that when God looks at us, he sees all our sins. Look how he sees Gideon and Barak and, and he even get and Samson. Do, do I need to pull up slides from an old sermon on Samson? You guys know how dumb he was? How flawed he was? I mean, this dude was drinking wine when he wasn't supposed to drink wine as a Nazarite. He was touching dead things when he wasn't supposed to touch dead things as a Nazarite. Dude's marrying uh, Philistine women and then, you know, getting all mad and doing riddles and gambling and making bets and uh, then loses his wife and gets mad and is uh, he's one around going to prostitutes and going, you know, carrying off city gates and uh, and then consorting with the the worst greedy woman ever, Delilah, who's obviously, obviously trying to destroy him and and doesn't really love him. I mean, isn't it funny how until they put out Samson's eyes, he can't see it. And once they put out his eyes, he can finally see. It's like, it's like God had to take away his eyes so he couldn't look lustfully at women anymore before the poor guy could think straight. Uh, but he finally comes to faith. And at the end of his life, he says, God, one more time, give me the strength so that I can remove these enemies of Israel. And he dies doing it. And he's listed in Hebrews 11. Out of all the people in the Old Testament, Gideon makes it. Barak makes it. Samson makes the list. Really? I mean, how many great people of faith didn't make the list here? Well, I don't think God was giving an exhaustive list, first of all. There's many other great people of faith who maybe even had stronger faith. I think that maybe he was giving a list of people to show God's grace and how he views people after the cross and how he used people of weak faith to do things. Even, even faith as small as a mustard seed can accomplish amazing things. So what I'm saying is, you're weak. Fine, me too. You're flawed. Yeah, join the club. You struggle to trust God sometimes. I think we all do. But take courage from these guys. And don't beat yourself up and hold on to the faithless mistakes of your past. I don't want you guys sitting around, you know, you know, I don't want Kyle sitting around 20 years from now. Oh, I could have done better in my first ministry. Or I don't want Braden go, well, if I'd only done done this thing, I don't want John going, if I'd only done this as a husband. Look, God forgives and forgets. Forgive yourself. He gave went to a guy hiding in a wine press and called him a mighty warrior. What, what would God call you? What's your potential? Gideon did become a mighty warrior. He chased down the remaining Midianites and he dealt with some other people who wouldn't help him. He gets bold. He gets some faith. He becomes a man. He goes from wimp to warrior for real. And so can you. He can give you courage. He can baby step you into it. So I just want you to be inspired by Barack and Gideon and Samson being in the list. You know, I want you to go, man, that, that's awesome. <laughs> so um, because we're, we're gotten through the material and because I need to drive tonight, I'm driving, I'm going to get off the here with you guys. And I'm going to drive straight to Louisville, Kentucky. 
um, which is uh, about 12 hours away from here. Because uh, tomorrow at noon, um, I have to teach in Louisville uh, tomorrow. So um, I am going to uh, let you guys go and um, have a shortened class today. Next week, again, we'll talk some more about some stuff in uh, Hebrews that maybe we burned over kind of fast because I was worried about not having enough time to get done. Turns out I had enough time, plenty of time. So um, we'll go back and we'll cover some more of chapter 11 next week. I'll send you your chapter 13 uh, questions today and you should get those today and you can have those for me next week. Any questions anybody have? Yes, John. Yeah, you wanted our uh, sermon to you by next week, correct? Yes, yes, you, that is correct. I will need your sermon by next week. Uh, so please, yeah. please, please turn in your sermon, okay? Um, by next week, and I'll, I'll just you can put it on YouTube or some so, something like that, and just send me a link, okay? Because your files are going to be too big to literally send, probably. So if you could put it on a somewhere and then send me a link, that would be great, okay? All right, let me pray for you guys. Kendall, Father in heaven, thank you so much. Hey, Kendall. Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh. Did it work for me to send you my video on WhatsApp last time? Yes. Yeah, that did work. Can I do that again? You sure can. No problem. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray you'd be with these guys, and I pray you'd bless them. I pray you'd be with me today as I travel um, up to Louisville, that you keep me safe. And I thank you for this opportunity to be with them and to teach them today. And uh, I thank you for the lessons from Hebrews 13. Uh, and I thank you, God, for throwing in there in Hebrews chapter 11, people like Gideon and Barak and 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 Samson who really struggled in their faith and yet did have faith and made a difference. And that inspires us, God, in our frailty and in our own uh, weaknesses that, that you will use us despite our weaknesses and that even though we're not perfect, you can use us for your glory and to do great things for your kingdom. And I pray, God, that you would work through us and that you would baby step us like you did Gideon and that you would take us from wimps into warriors and help us and increase our faith so that we can do more and more for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, guys. Love you. Take care. We'll see you.